<laughs> Let's welcome in Steve Cleveland, the present coach Steve Cleveland, back on BYU Sports Nation. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing well. What, what do you think of this this uh, outlandish topic we're discussing? Does BYU deserve to be a top 25 preseason team? First of all, as we mentioned a moment ago, what exactly does Fox know about anything dealing with basketball? <laughs> oh, <laughs> baseball, bring in the heat! Oh. Baseball, football. We're hoping I to think... bring on a guest in the future. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Do we have any affiliations with Fox here? <laughs> Not that I know. <laughs> no, we don't have them anymore. <laughs> uh, you know, here's the deal. I, I think we need to be more concerned about where the team finishes rather than the preseason. I, sure. I have a hard time figuring out why, other than the fact they are talented. But usually preseason is based upon what you did and well, who you have coming back rather than just who you have. And, and talent is never enough. We know that. So I would say that's a little premature. And all that does immediately is start jacking up the expectations again. And right now, I think that's the last thing this team in this program needs. Yeah, it went really well last year. So yeah. let's do it again this year. <laughs> yeah. Well, let, before we really get into the, the BYU stuff for today, let's go back to the championship game. What did you, what did you think of the, uh, the national championship game, which obviously North Carolina won over Gonzaga? So that – I, I did pick North Carolina. I felt good about that. Most of the other picks were not very successful. I didn't have a great bracket this year. <laughs> but I did pick Carolina because I'd been back there, and I mentioned it before. We went back there for about 10 days and watched them play. And I liked their team. I liked their length. I knew their length and athleticism and ability to rebound the ball offensively would make a difference. And when we talked about this before, I felt like – Joel Berry would be the X factor, and he was the X factor. I mean, he made big baskets when they needed him. It was an ugly game to watch, hard fought. I think the most touching thing for me, uh, and I've obviously watched a lot of these, but the interview with Nigel Williams-Goss at the end was as special and authentic and as any, any interview I've ever seen. I mean, the hurt and the pain and, and, and the, it's just the sincerity of that young man. And I love when Mark Few talked about his team and talked about – these are good students. These are good people. And, and it's a privilege for me to, to be with them. So I think all of us wanted Gonzaga to win that thing. But at the end of the day, North Carolina just made one more play. And we knew it was going to end like that. And when it came down to athleticism and getting an offensive rebound, North Carolina has kind of proven they could do that. So it wasn't, it wasn't aesthetically that, that pretty to look what, and watch until the last three minutes. It was funny when with a group of guys, all of a sudden we get excited the last three and a half minutes. <laughs> Baskets are actually being made, going back and forth. But we waited a long time to get that feeling in that game. Gonzaga with its greatest season ever, of course, going to the national championship game, which was fun to watch. St. Mary's expected to be right there, Coach. And then where does BYU fit in that mix? Because we discussed yesterday, St. Mary's uh, a preseason top 25 kind of club as well. You th do you think BYU can crack the top two? You know, yes. I think to crack the top two, you have to split with St. Mary's. I mean, they proved they can split with Gonzaga three years in a row. And so you've, you've, you've got to beat – St. Mary's at home. And then I think, I think more important than anything is that I, I know Coach Rose pretty well. And, and I've not had conversations with him recently, so none of this is based upon something I know. But just my experiences with him, there are going to be changes. And, and not just defensively. I, I think he'll look at this group. They made some mid-season changes and tried to go more inside out with Mika and all of those things. And at times it worked and at times it didn't. There was frustration and there was inconsistency. But I, I just know in my heart that you're going to see different kind of basketball next year at the defensive end, at the offensive end. Players are going to know their roles. It's going to be very well defined what a good shot is and what isn't a good shot. They're on the road recruiting. Uh, th there will be some additions. And you have mentioned earlier that Zach Salius is back. And, uh, and, I, and I think he'll have an immediate impact in the program because he can play the four. And he can play, he can stretch, he can play the small, the small four against a lot of teams, certainly in this league, and, and, and probably in the preseason as well. And when you put four shooters out there with his experience, it'll take him a while to come back. I think that is probably his best recruit of the spring, was having him come back. As difficult as it is, because I know just being with missionaries, going home is never an easy thing. Uh, but I, I think it's the decision's been made. It moved forward. He did, you know, he went out and served well, and, and now he's going to come home and, and have a major contribution to this team next year. Speaking of decisions, the one decision that all BYU basketball fans are waiting on is ultimately to find out if Eric Mika decides to stay in the draft or come back to BYU. And there's just going to take time before that question is answered. But how much does that decision? significantly change your opinion on what this team can accomplish next year? Does it significantly change what you think they can do 
if he's here or if he's gone? If they don't replace him, yes. I, would, you know, they, I mean, if they bring in a 6'8 or a 6'9 junior college transfer that's played 60 games, um, is there someone out there, a fifth-year senior? I mean, there's a lot of unanswered questions before we can use the word, is there a significant loss? Certainly, it will be a loss. It, but you can fill that void with additional recruits, improved play, change the culture defensively. A lot of those things can make up for a loss like Mika. Now, they, they certainly, if they have him, uh, you, you feel like, you know what, they can go. They, this is a team that not only can finish, I believe, in the top two, but we can get to the tournament and maybe win a game. Because no one really understands, uh, unless you've played this game or coached this game, how difficult it is to, to have that many young players. And I know that it that comes off somewhat as an excuse, but the fact is they were very young. Coach Rose has never had a team like this. I mean, when I left, there was a lot of players in the program, experienced players, and he molded them and brought them together. And that first year was probably, uh, it was an NIT year, but still there were players there that had been through it a little bit. And so I think we look at this group and we say, you know what, it wasn't perfect. They still won 22 games. Uh, they did beat Gonzaga at Gonzaga, so we see the potential. But I think with system changes, maybe a, an additional recruit or two, and having Zach Sevius come back, and if Mika stays, it's a very special team. It'll be a lot of hard work this summer. But I, I trust Coach Rose in the fact that I can just tell from facial expressions and comments that inside it, things are turning. And when they get back, and they probably are back now, you're going to see a lot of work put in in the spring and the summer to change the culture defensively, and I think even offensively, to make sure everyone going from the get-go understands their role. BYU uh, has one too many guys projected for scholarships going into next year. There's always transfers. There's always something you don't expect, right? So it evens itself out. Right. But with the JC guys, like you talked about, Aren't all the really good – I mean, there's diamonds in the rough for sure, but aren't all the really good ones already taken up at this point? It's kind of a difficult timing situation, it, it right? Is a, it is a difficult timing situation. And I talked about this the other day with, with some friends, and, you know, the transfer situation now starts brewing, and, and especially with senior transfers. And everybody I, – I mentioned this the other day, but, you know, the most important 30 days in – all of the year for college basketball is March. You know, and there's a lot of disinterest. With the casual fan, people aren't really paying attention, but everybody. I mean, grandma has a bracket. Uh, <laughs> the nine-year-old has a bracket. Everybody's focused. And I think when transfers are taking place, whether they're from junior colleges, Division One, or seniors that, uh, or people that, young men that have graduated, they're all looking for a place where they can be and get that exposure in March. And I think the fact that BYU's been to the tournament eight times in the last 12 years, the fact that, that they're probably going to be back into the tournament, bodes well for them in terms of the transfer business as well. Because that's, when, that's where people want to go. They don't want to transfer somewhere where they're not going to get that exposure with the dream of playing in the NBA or playing in Europe. So I, I think there's some things that we'll see evolve. It's, I think it's too soon right now to, to know what significant losses are and what they aren't. But I, I know this, there will be significant changes, okay, in terms of how the game is played. That I do know. Hmm. Of those players who are coming back that we know of for sure, who do you think is poised to take the biggest leap? Well, he'll, he'll be given way more responsibility, especially if Mika leaves, and that's Yoli. Uh, I, I think that uh, he'll spend, if he needs to spend the spring and the summer, obviously continuing to work on his low post moves, because he can, but his perimeter skills. He, he needs to work on those perimeter skills because if Mika does come back, if he could develop. Right now it's Mika stepping out and hitting that 17-day team footer, but if Yoli can step out. So I think that the maturity of how to play the game defensively, how to stay out of foul trouble, I think all those lessons he's learned, and I think everything's going to be ratcheted up a little bit in terms of strength and conditioning, in terms of expectations in the offseason, and especially in the sense of who's going to be the leaders of this team, who's going to step up. Is this going to be a player-led team or will continue just to be a coach-led team? And I think when it becomes a player-led team, uh, you, you, the, the sky's the limit and there's a ceiling is much higher. When you look at the talent that BYU brings back, there's a, there's a lot of guys there. Um, how did you balance the need to have a good scheme with personnel? Because a lot of coaches talk about, oh, yeah, we have to cater to the personnel, obviously. Yet, Dave Rose has this five-slamma-jamma, high-powered offense that's been successful. Yeah. Yet the last couple of years, the defensive end is, you know, need a little bit of work. So how do you balance that? 
You know, I think first of all, offensively, I, I think they're gonna they're gonna play with a lot of pace on misses, and I think the, the shots need to be defined, and and players need to be defined. Literally, you know, we 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 talk about hey, you know what? Right now, you're at the point where I, I trust you to take that mid range shot in transition, or we want to go in the low post, but keep working on the perimeter because that that's until you prove to me in practice you can make that shot on a regular basis, I'm probably not gonna have you take that early in the shot clock. I mean, we're just not gonna do that. So certain guys would have the green light early in the shot clock, but and, others would and, not. And, and you define those things and you talk about those, and not in a demeaning way, but just this is where we are. Mm -hmm. What are we gonna do to make to be the sum of our parts? How can we be the best together? in terms of all the talent. And so those things will be established this summer and in, in the preseason. I, I think also that, uh, I think everything that they do in strength and conditioning, everything that they do has to have something to do with a stance defensively. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I think you develop that culture by talking about it. And I know they will, I'm not talking about things they won't do. But I, I think that, uh, you know, offensively, I think, I think that you're gonna see a, maybe, maybe a little more of a system involved in makes and dead balls where we make sure that we get what we want to get and we execute and we set good screens and get shots rather than giving them the same freedom you get on misses because then it just comes it just turns into a single ball screen and let's go make a play and if you don't have as good a players as they do it you don't win and so I think I, I think coach Rose got a great mind for the game we played that way a little bit when I was here because we didn't have the talent level early on. But I got really comfortable as a coach on misses, we're going to push it, and on makes, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to run something that's defined, has a role, looking for a specific person. And then at the end, then you use the ball screens rather than just starting from the beginning. Yeah, at the end of the shot clock and, and when there's start, desperation. E right? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so I think there's going to be some more definition to that. And, again, it does not come from any conversation I had. Just knowing this coaching staff, I feel like uh, we're going to see those changes. Well, you, you've mentioned what you, you expect this offseason to be a little different. And realizing that, obviously, unless you win the national championship game, every team ends – on a disappointing loss. With that said, though, heading into a an off season where you're feeling pretty good about things, versus heading into an off season where you realize you probably didn't live up to maybe your own expectations. How how are how do you manage those two different scenarios in an off season? Well, you have you have your player meetings. You have your team meetings. You're going to be together a lot during the summer. They allow them to do that. I think you talk about those things. You have to be really transparent with these young people. I mean, you can't, you just can't keep things in and just expect them to understand it. You got to, you, to develop a culture where there's communication and understanding about exactly what this staff wants, there has to be discussions and talks about this. And so, you know, maybe they didn't finish like they wanted to. But the, the fact is that I think most of that was based upon expectations. Now, the fact, here's, here's the thing. They, they did not play very well in their last couple of games, okay? That's what, it's not so much what their record was or they didn't get to the tournament. is how did they play? How did they play at the end of the year? Not and all losses are created equal. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? exactly. And, and so it, it's not so much about their record or maybe even getting to the tournament because at, what is most important is how can, we be, how can we not duplicate or replicate what happened at the end of the year? What can we do to be better? And I think it's more about how they played than any lack of coaching or anything else. It, it just, they just didn't play to what I think, even think their expectations were. And I think a lot of that did lead to just expectations, youth, and, and, and a frustration that seemed to permeate the organization. And now you got a chance to get a fresh start, clean start, and let's, let's move forward. And you've got some really talented players back who have a strong desire to be successful and win. And I know a coaching staff that does the same. So I, I see this blending and I see some growth. I think we're going to really be pleased with the product that comes out early on. When you see that first scrimmage, there's going to be a different intensity and mindset than there has been in this previous year with a very young and inexperienced team. Frank Martin, the South Carolina head coach, who was at Kansas State, who beat BYU in the second round, Jim Fredette's uh, junior year in 2010, he was asked a question by an SI uh, kid reporter. What do you like more, attitude or, you know, what matters more, attitude or technique? I think you're getting at that. If, if the attitude is uh, maybe a little different, that could be changed there. And it's interesting because when you, when you kind of flush out a group of guys that graduates, you can kind of start fresh. But you're starting fresh with – a very similar group, so that's maybe more of a challenge, right? No, I, I, yeah, it, it is, but I like I like your thinking, and I think when you're you're talking about cultures of teams, organization, businesses, government, whatever it might be, and you look at what's important, it, the the attitude and the mindset are critical. I mean, you watch South Carolina play, 
And you saw how they competed. You saw how Gonzaga competed and North Carolina competed. They, they didn't take a possession off. There were no possessions, okay? They, they played and competed. And even though it wasn't pretty and, it, it, you know, aesthetically, offensively to watch, it may not have been what you wanted. They competed. And I, and I think that's the mindset with this group is going in that we're going to compete, that we have a mindset that we're going to get stops. And we're going to take as much joy coming from a stop or a big rebound rather than the ooh and ah block. That'd be okay? a paradigm shift. Yeah, you know, yeah. it is a total paradigm shift. And so you take that shift and you move it to the, the, that other end of the floor and then you share the ball. And I felt like they shared the ball this year, though. I think what happened is that at, in, in certain games, and Coach Rose alluded to this several times, individually, individually, they felt like they had to take it on themselves. And, you know, with eight or ten, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I need to make the play. You know, not, not from a selfish standpoint, but that's just what I need to do. And you can't play that way. You know, you can't play that way. Everything's defined even at the end of the shot clock. And obviously, there are times you have to just take a contested shot. But I think that culture, as it's established, it is a paradigm shift. And I think it'll take place and it'll happen. And more than likely, uh, guys got back this week. They'll probably be starting up as soon as school's out with their spring and summer workouts and recruiting. But uh, I, I like the mindset uh, that, uh, that I think Coach Rose is very familiar with and I think he'll be very committed to. He knows it. He's talked about it publicly. And uh, I won't be surprised to, to see a different group of young men with a, a different attitude and a different commitment to this game and to each other. Lots of work to do and lots of work will be done soon. Coach, we appreciate the time. Thanks You're for welcome. coming in. Good to be with you. Steve Cleveland on BYU Sports Nation.